everyone. Good afternoon. So it's now 4.02. Um, can I get a confirmation if you can hear me, my participants? Can I get a thumbs up? We can hear yes, you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, okay. So, um, first, let me remind you that this uh, webinar is recorded as well as it is streamed live on Facebook. So, if you have friends or colleagues who weren't able to register, please do share the, uh, the link to them. All right. So, um, I'm seeing... 22 participants now, but I feel like more are coming. So um, even so, uh, let's go ahead and start. All right. So um, everyone, welcome to the Fundamentals of Power Plant Electrical Protection Systems. Today is November 19, 2021, and it is 4 p.m. here in the Philippines. Uh, this webinar will be led by Mr. Dario Makatangay, a subject matter expert from EDC. Uh, we will get to know more about him later on. Okay, so um, I'm seeing um, participants as well, uh, participants from uh, UAE as well as Indonesian. So uh, thank you for being here. We are uh, ha happy to have you. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, on behalf of Eriodite Reli Reliability Services, uh, we welcome you. So we are a duly registered corporation in the Philippines that provides a physical asset performance management and consulting services to industries of all types, including manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas exploration and refining, and various chemical and process industries. Um, these are some of our uh, partners. If you'd like to know more about them, please visit our uh, official website, www.eridite.com. That com that ph okay yeah so um more reminders pupala uh we will have a question and answer portion at the end of the this webinar at the end of the discussion so if you will have any questions um please feel free to message it on the chat section so we can collect them later on all right so um i won't be I don't want to drag this any longer. Uh, let me introduce to you to our speaker, Mr. Dario Makatangay. He led and completed the Source Sugon Bakman Palayan Unit 2 Generator, the GSU AUT Protection Upgrade. The scope of responsibilities included planning, engineering, and implementation, testing, and commissioning. He led and completed the Motor Bus Transfer Project. the motor control centers and emergency distribution panels and had completed the complex scope of planning, engineering, scope of work, and detailed engineering for generator and GSU, Upper Mahiao Geothermal Plant in Leyte, Philippines. He led and completed the Mount Apo Geothermal Plant Unit 2 generator, generator step up, and auxiliary unit transformer protection upgrade project. The scope of work includes planning, engineering, impl implementation, testing, and commissioning. He provided consultant consultancy, technical, and troubleshooting support during maintenance shutdowns and during forced outages. He provided technical consultancy for the development of strategic plans involving generator GSU and AUT protection upgrades. In his previous career, he spent about 22 years from various power and utility companies in the United States of America, majority of which was spent in Dominion Energy in Virginia, USA. He is also a professional engineer in the state of Virginia and a professional electrical engineer in the Philippines. He graduated M, um, the master's degree of electrical engineering in Drexel University, Philadelphia. So without further ado, everyone, please give um, a virtual applause uh, to welcome Mr. Dario Makatangay. Mr. Dario? Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think uh, I'm kind of humbled with that, you know, uh, initial discussion what I've done, but actually I'm, I'm just like you guys. <laughs> we are all the same here. Anyway, so uh, I'm here to actually share what uh, 
you know, my previous experiences. And I guess probably you have also other experiences that you may want to share. But, uh, you know, hopefully this uh, discussion will please help us in our daily uh, task in, you know, power generation and for the good of all. So, uh, so uh, what was said already, um, actually our topic is about uh, the power generation protection system mostly. Um, I guess there's so many things that can be discussed about the power plants, but uh, because we only have an hour of webinar, I think we might just concentrate on generate generator protection for, for now. Um, now, uh, if ever there's something here that, you know, if I say that you might disagree, it's okay. <laughs> Just consider that we are colleagues here. We're going to, you know, try to uh, discuss the basics. And then after the basics, we're going to actually delve on the protection issues. So uh, with that, do you think uh, I can already, uh, pa Patty, do you think I can already share my screen here? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Can, uh, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Good. All right. So, um, okay. So the, uh, the purpose of our, uh, small webinar here is to, uh, number one, to review the fundamentals of power generation as they apply to generator protection system. Um, review the basic power generation protection systems. Uh, review power generation issues. And uh, review or introduce typical generator protection methods. So let's move on. All right. So again, um, we are going to discuss first the basics so that we have some kind of uh, like a basic background. I mean, we studied this in college and we probably, these things are probably fresh in our minds. But uh, in order to actually uh, learn and uh, you know, discuss the more complicated ones. We got to go to the basics. But uh, if, if, if it is okay, may I ask the, how the your experiences about power systems protection? Is there any in the in the attendees who are really uh, who has uh, uh, what kind of experience do you have already at this point? Am I uh, so looks like this is new to me. One to three years experience is 29%. More than five years per experience, 10%. Okay, all right. Okay, so, all right. So the new is 50%, okay. All right. So uh, again, so if I'll be asking, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, for those who have uh, actually uh, experienced and well versed about this, maybe, uh, and since there are so many people, that looks like it's there, it's new to them, 50%. So uh, I'm kind of have to, you know, lean on doing and speaking about the more, a little bit more of the fundamentals. Uh, but then, if you guys know many things, of, I mean. If you're already an expert in this, uh, you know, please bear with me, okay? All right, so from the basics, uh, you know that to produce energy, and according to Michael, to Mr. Faraday, uh, we need changing magnetic field and conductor uh, to produce the voltage. It's because, uh, it's it's uh, it, this is the this is really the beauty of electrical engineering, you know. Um, you can produce voltage just by uh, you know exposing uh, 
magnetism, the conductor to magnetism and get that magnetic field moving, right? So if I will you know, translate this into logic, I would say that the two inputs are the changing magnetic field and the conductor. The output could be the voltage. And mathematically speaking, is equal to minus n times d phi dt, where d phi dt represents the uh, changing magnetic field, and n is the number of turns of the conductor. So, uh, and if you will review again the basics, uh, the two types make the two types of generator. How you uh, the, the physical, and this is actually the, the basic physical structure, is that you have. Uh, revolving armature and uh, revolving field. Uh, now, I am showing here an AC generator. Uh, if you look at the revolving magnetic uh, armature generator, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, magnetic field is, uh, you're setting up a magnetic field from a DC source. You have uh, this, uh, you know, magnetic field crossing from north to south. And then you have the conductor that you rotate. And then from there, when you, you know, rotate this and it's changing, then you produce an AC voltage, an AC output. So you would need the slip rings and, and the process to collect those voltage. Um, this type, as you can see, is uh, the armature which is producing the output is actually the one rotating, okay? The other one uh, for large generators, you can see that the output is actually stationary here. So, because if it is a, a huge generator, of course you don't wanna rotate a huge mass of energy. So it's better to actually have the output uh, stationary while the field, the magnetic field is changing and rotating and you produce the uh, magnetic field from the, you know, from the DC source here. Now, if this becomes, uh, looking at the top, if this is uh, a DC generator, uh, then instead of the slip rings, you have commutator bars, okay, because if you want the DC output, so that's a DC generator, okay? So, so far, uh, am I clear on this, though? So I'll con continue on. Um, um, give me a second here. Hi, Patty. Can you hear me well? Can, can, can they hear me well? Yes, sir. I can. Okay. All right. So just uh, let me know if, I, if there's anything that I need to I adjust. Okay. All right. So, so again, coming back from the basic, we need, uh, we need two elements. We need the magnetic field, changing magnetic field, and we want the conductor itself to produce the voltage. So when you look at this, uh, the output here, for example, this one, this is the output. And you have here the magnetic field. This is the changing magnetic field, OK? Um, and the conductor is this whole number, number of turns you know, wrap on the stator, then you're actually ex exposing these conductors to this rotating magnetic field. So therefore, in power generation, excitation is very important because exciter produce the magnetic field, right? So uh, going here to the, to the uh, you know, to the elements needed to produce voltage, then you would see that there are several types of excitation systems, okay? And excitation systems can, you know, it, 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 
ranges from the more simple type to the more complex type. Now, again, this exciter is used to produce the magnetic field, okay? And here you can see that at the bottom here, this is your generator. The AC output is being provided here at the main generator. Actually, I have not shown that three wires here, which is a three phase you know, circuit that provides the three phase voltage here at the bottom. Okay, I did not show the, the lines anymore, just for simplicity. But now if we concentrate here on the excitation, if we review this, as you know, uh, this type of excitation is using a DC generator. Uh, you are, we are trying to produce a magnetic field here. This is your generator. This is your, if you go back here, this is your armature. And this is, this is your stator, actually, this is your stator. And this is your rotor here, which is the magnetic field, right? So the rotor, if it's a rotor, it's rotating, right? So as you can see here, this whole box here is actually one of the member of the rotating elements, right? And this one produces the magnetic field. And it, the, the, the coil or the conductors in the gener generator in, interacts with the moving magnetic field, then you can produce, then you produce the voltage. So to complete the system, you need a source of that excitation. So you need a DC generator. So the, the DC generator is a commutator and process instead of slip rings and process. And you need to run this generator. So you can see that this portion is rotating as well as this one is rotating. So they are on the common shaft, you know, one common shaft rotating. So the DC generator and this exciter here are both rotating, both moving, revolving. So DC is provided here, collected here at the process. This portion here is stationary then it's now you know, transferred back to the field by our revolving field through collectors, collector rings and process. Now remember, if it is AC generator, it's collector, eh, collector rings and process. If it is DC generator, it's commutator and process. Now you would need excitation controls. This is where your uh, ABR is you know, located at. And you know the ABR, that's important in the um, controls of voltage because voltage you need to control the flow of megavars okay megavars is inductive energy that is needed to maintain synchronism with the system because if you don't have this magnetic field you can be out of synchronism and then you actually damage the generator right so uh Excitation system is very important in the process. And we need to protect the system along with the generator. Now we go to the second type of the excitation system. We have uh, uh, using a diode bridge. So before we have a DC generator. Now we're replacing here the DC generator we replaced with, we replaced it with an AC generator. Okay, now with this AC generator, then we're using brasses and collector rings here. Now you can see that this two portion here, the field that, that is used for the AC generator is rotating with the field of the main generator. Okay, and you know, this bridge here, which is a three phase diode, usually a six pulse, you know, a thyristor type. Uh, this is actually a uh, you know, it's stationary here, all right? So now this portion here is stationary, stationary. And then again, you need that excitation controls to um, ensure that enough magnetic field is provided in the generator, either to boost the voltage or to re reduce the voltage output of the main generator. Just remember that excitation has something to do with the amount of voltage that you need to put into the system. Now, when you're talking about voltage, it's about excitation. Now, when you're talking about power, megawatt, it's about the amount of energy 
that is passed from the turbine to the generator. So those are two separate things. So now this is using an exciter using a, a diode bridge. Now uh, this one here is a, another modification. They use a brassless uh, exciters now. So as you can see, there is no the they eliminated the brasses. Okay. So when they eliminated the brasses, you need that diodes to be rotating. So it has a rotating diode with itself. So the AC generator with rotating diode. Uh, it's feeding the DC part of the main generator. This is the rotating parts. Again, station control. This one is uh, a static type. Uh, as you can see, power is actually derived from the CT and PT. It's, you know, from the generator output. It has its own by restore control and excitation transformer and fed to the uh, rotating uh, you know, pin. That's static exciter, okay? So it's already 423, so we need to move a little bit faster, okay? Now, we go to the generator uh, plant configuration, typical generator configuration. This one is a unit, this is the, the base, the, the most fundamental configuration. It's a unit generator transformer configuration. When we say it's a unit, it's the whole assembly here, the generator, the unit transformer and the step up are all actually uh, on, on and off all together, okay? So you can see there's a breaker here, okay, on the top. So uh, when you are doing maintenance on their system, the, typically you would, you know, open this breaker, secure this breaker open, and then you can maintain the generator. So therefore, when you go back to the system again, we wanna trans, um, connect to the system again, to the transmission system, then you will have to uh, synchronize this whole system with the power system using this breaker here, this one here, right? So uh, this one is, you know, um, a little bit less reliable because when you lose the entire, you, you trip the generator, you trip the whole thing. You trip the auxiliary transfer, you trip the whole thing. You trip the transformer, same thing, all right? So not much flexibility here, okay? Now, the second type, which is, you know, to improve this, in nuclear power plants, they have introduced, uh, some of them, they have introduced this reserve station service transformer, okay? So although you can see that the breaker here on the generator is on the step up transformer, okay? You can still, you can, you can maintain this and you can still maintain service to the plant during shutdown because you're actually powering it from the reserve station service here, right? So during normal condition, you know, normal operating uh, situation, then this breaker is closed, this breaker is closed, this breaker is closed. This is your emergency bus, this is normally open here, and then this is your normal station service bus. All the emergency loads are fed, powered from this emergency buses, okay? Especially in the nuclear, they have, you know, lots of emergency stuff. So this is powered on this emergency bus. Now, this station service bus here feed the, 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 the power needed to support the operation of the generator. It's a normal station service bus. So when you're doing maintenance on generator, this generator, then this will be open, this will be open, this will be open, this, this breaker here will be open, you can see my, my cursor here, um, Patty. Can, can you see it? So the cursor, uh, Patty. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can see it. You can, you can see the cursor, right? I mean, they, they can yes. see the cursor. Okay. So this will be open here, uh, breaker here, and this one will be closed. So they can actually maintain this whole thing using uh, with this in, in reserve station service transport energize. When you, let's say you have a fault here, when you have a fault here, then you can still maintain power to the system, okay? To the emergency system. And actually what happened is you can still uh, power the, 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 all the loads needed to support this generator. Let's say this one trip. If this one trip, this one will open and this one will open, right? There's a fault here. This one will open, this one will open. However, this one will close, okay? So upon, upon closing, uh, upon closure of this breaker, 
you're actually powering all the loads that is used to support the generator operation. So you, it's you know it's not you know it's not going to be a bad thing because you can easily uh, there's uh, you, you have less time to actually uh, energize prepare all the units for uh, the the restart. Okay. Now the 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 other type now is this. Uh, unit transformer with generator breaker configuration. Okay, this is typical in most of the plants that I've seen here. Uh, we have uh, a generator breaker, you know, and then we have uh, a unit transformer, low side breaker, and a unit transformer, high side breaker here. Okay, now you have a unit auxiliary transformer that supports the loads needed to. Uh, of needed, needed for the operation of the generator and the turbine. So here, one thing good here is that let's say you have a fault on the transformer, okay? So when you have a fault in the transformer, this breaker here will open, this breaker here will open, okay? Now you don't have to open this because the turbine might have a load rejection capability. You know, do you know what's load rejection capability? Load uh, rejection capability is the ability of the turbine to go back to the normal speed after the load is, you know, lost. For example, if you have a fault here, once, because, you know, before the fault, actually, uh, the generator is powering the, the grid, right? Powering the, it's, it's, it's contributing power to the grid. So there's a large, large amount of power flows due to, to the transformer, okay? So when you have a fault in the transformer, if this opens, this breaker opens, then there's a big loss of load. You know, when you have a big lo huge lo loss of load, uh, the generator in the tur tur turbine might go to instability. You know, it, the operation may become stable because, as you know, you know before the the before it, the the breaker tripping, uh, this generator is syn synchronized with the system. Okay. Once you lose, you lose a huge amount of load, the uh, generator uh, and the turbine might, it, you know, might go to change, or, you know, change and increase the speed, over speed, or, or it, you can trip the, the, the generator and the turbine all together. So therefore, what happens is that, you know, if you have lo good load rejection capability, then once you lose this transformer, you can still maintain the generator running and power the unit auxiliary transformer. Now, so that's, that's a good thing, right? You can, you know, you can, it, it's still uh, with that, you know, outage of this transformer, uh, you have the, uh, um, I mean, large amount, I mean, you can, you can easily restart the generator and it's more economical operation, right? Another thing here, another good thing here is that, let's say you have a fault on the generator, okay? So if you have a fault on the generator, what you can do is just flip this breaker here, right? And once this breaker is tripped, actually the system will just power the unit auxiliary transformer. So you still maintain service, right? Then once you find the fault and corrected the issue, all you need to do is just synchronize this breaker. So if you have a fault on the transformer, and this one here, the generator powers the load, then after correction of the fault in the transformer, then you can synchronize here. Oh, this one here, of course you have to trip this. This, this one here, let you have to close this one first, I'm sorry. And then synchronize here, okay? So far so good? Okay. Okay, good, thank you. All right, there's another, Another configuration here. This is typical in industrial plants. You have several generators connected on the same bus. Okay, so you have you can see here that they are connected in parallel with unit transformer on the same bus. One common auxiliary transformer. Um, there is some some issues here is associated with the ground fault. It's kind of difficult to coordinate the protection here because uh, they are connected in parallel. So there are some special arrangements to actually uh, um, 
implement a protection here in parallel generators. All right, so having discussed the uh, types of uh, uh, plant configuration and excitation configuration as well, the issues that actually that we are facing here in generator protection um, is uh, complex in its own by itself. You know, um, of course, transmission and distribution is also, also complex, um, but generator protection is also, you know, it, it, in its own right, it is complex. Uh, we need to protect the generator from ground faults. We need to protect the generator from from too much magnetic field over excitation. Um, we need to uh, maintain the operation of the generator uh, from the limits, the limits, uh, generator transformer and system capability limits. Limits. We're talking about not the generator only, but we are also talking about limits uh, on the generator, the transport, and how it affects the power systems, the transmission system, as well as the turbine sometimes. Um, we need to protect the generator from uh, current imbalances, you know, negative sequence of currents. Uh, phase over current protection, this is one thing that's diff different in generator protection because the generator is different from the system when, you, when it incurs a, a fault because the impedance of the generator is changing immediately after the fault. So at T0, at T0 plus, when you have after a fault, the reactance of the generator is very small. It's subtransient reactance. So if it is very small, like in the 20% in the range, 20% value, 20, uh, 0.2 per unit, that implies a very high you know current at the start uh it's ac you know um now as the fault progress the impedance the reactor the inductive the, the, the impedance of the generator changes from subtransient to transient so it's a little bit bigger than the uh than the subtransient um so the fault current is decaying now, okay? Now, there'll be a time that if the fault is not interrupted, uh, that impedance can turn to a very low value, even uh, impedance, um, the current can be smaller than the rated full load current of the generator it's because of the high synchronous uh, impedance. It's XD. XD is a, a lot of times higher than the per unit. The, no, the one per unit. Okay, so that is for the overcurrent protection. So yeah, it's kind of, you know, that needs to be considered when you're protecting a generator. It's the current decay from a very high value to a smaller value. And there, there is a time constant associated with it. It's transient in nature. Um, typically, um, the, the problem here is that if the current, you know, um, it, sometimes the, the challenge here is that um, when you're having this kind of current, the backup protection might need to see even the smallest value of the current that can be possible to occur. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, they're supporting the transmission system and it was not interrupted and it goes to the, you know, uh, uh, synchronous phase, uh, you know, the, 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 the protection, short circuit protection must be able to interrupt the breaker. Um, now, another thing that needs to be considered is the loss of synchronism. Okay, so again, the system and the generator are synchronized, so we're ha they're happy when they're synchronized. But then if there's a fault in the system, for example, and if, especially if the generator, like in the, you know, in the, like in the, if they have a big power generator, um, or it's a large system, and especially if uh, 
the system is weak, then uh, they call what they have what they call a short circuit center. So when they have actually when you lose a synchronous when you lose synchronism, um, when you lose synchronism, then what happens is that you go into the unstable state, and if there's a fault in the system, the generator needs to see whether it needs to trip or not to trip. Because the problem is, if you lose synchronism, that means that indicates you're losing step. You know, it's going to be an out of step operation. In other words, the magnetic field is not synchronized anymore with the, uh, with the, the, ro the rotor field is not synchronized anymore with the, you know, synchronous field, the, the, the armature or the, uh, the, the field, uh, the part, it's not, I mean, the power system, the system itself, you, the, the rotor, the magnetic field is not synchronized anymore with the system itself. You lose synchronism. When you lose synchronism, you get out of step and you can easily damage the generator because of the pulsating current. It's running, you know, it's going to be an unstable operation. Um, protection from inadvertent operation, for example, uh, this is like inadvertent energization. Say, say for example, uh, you're doing maintenance on the generator. Suddenly, uh, they the, someone closed the breaker, so the system powered the generator from idle condition, and that will be like you're running the generator as a motor, like a motor. You know, the motor when it starts, like it's the pull of current. The starting current is like almost six times, right? So this is like this. You know, you you uh, suddenly energize a, stand, a generator from standstill. There is no magnetic field. You can damage the generator. Motoring protection is actually a reverse power. Motoring protection is when, for example, uh, you are, motoring power uh, protection happens when you lose the prime mover input. So you have the turbine input to the generator, right? And then suddenly you lose the turbine. So therefore, what happens is that the system needs, uh, well, the, the generator cannot, of course, uh, stop if you continue to rotate. So it's going to be on a motoring. It's going to drive the the turbine, and and then of course uh, the system will power it. So it's motoring protection. Then you need to you know trip the generator from reverse power. Abnormal voltage and frequency. Of course, that's a, you know we have a, uh, that situation. You know it needs to need to protect the generator because of the you know. Um, uh, there are some requirements in the grid that. Uh, we have the grid code here in the Philippines that we need to maintain some frequency during operations to maintain uh, uh, maintain the system. But then, of course, uh, voltage um, can be dangerous. It can go to high volume. Let's say, for example, you get a high volts per hertz, and that can be like the overexcitation effect uh, issue. Then you can actually uh, damage generator. Okay, so let's move on. All right, so sensitivity versus security. Okay, so in terms of protection, um, we have to balance uh, sensitivity and security. What, we, what I mean by sensitivity is the ability of the protection to actually see the, uh, see the current, you know, and sense the current and actually uh, isolate the defective system, you know, uh, promptly. That's sensitivity. It, it's sensitive, you know, from its word. Now, security means that so you, 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 you cannot, you should not trap uh, the generator when it's not needed to trap. For example, uh, there's protection coordination, the transformer needs to trap, but the generator does not need to trap. So that is part of the security issue that needs to be uh, considered. So uh, when we're doing, uh, you know, systems analysis, we wanna see uh, the effect to the system as well as the balance between sensitivity and security, okay? All right, now we go to the nitty gritty now. Protection from ground faults. All right, so there are types of connections um, generator that we use. The first type is the ungrounded generator. It could be an ungrounded Y or it could be a delta connected generator. Now, 
the problem with this is that, um, well, first thing, talk about the advantage. Okay, so let's say you, you have a first ground fault. You, you, you have a face a ground fault here, right? For example, right? So the first ground fault will only cause a small current to flow because you see there are some capacitances to ground. You know, it's coming from the generator itself, from the GS from the GSU, from the cable. It's all imaginary capacitance to ground. It doesn't exist, but it's there, you know. It's static electricity, right? So now, when you have a ground fault, you can see that if there's a ground fault here, you might wonder, well, even if I have a ground fault here, you know, I don't have continuity. Well, you have, you still have because of the capacitance to ground, okay? So therefore, but that's very small, okay? So it's tolerable. So, you, you know, when you have a ground fault and an ungrounded generator, it will not trip right away. But the problem is that the voltage on the healthy phases will increase, you know, it will increase and subject those healthy phases to insulation damage and will cause a double line to ground fault, which is destructive. The problem with an ungrounded system, we do not normally use this, is it's very, it's very the difficulty of finding that ground fault very difficult because you would not know where to find it, okay? That's the first type, okay? Um, second type uh, is the unground, well, in order to use ungrounded generators, what they do sometimes is they can install uh, a Y uh, Delta uh, grounding transformer. So, you know, why grounded, why ground, why, uh, or uh, why broken delta transformer here? This is your grounding transformer here, okay? So these are your generators here. You see it's ungrounded here. And this is your unit auxiliary transformer. It's your, you know, um, GSU. Now to see uh, an example of how the current flows, let's go to the next page here. So this is using a Y uh, delta uh, grounding transformer here, right? So you can see here, uh, this is your delta and grounded generator. So when you have a ground fault here, when you have a ground fault here, uh, the path of the current will be here, right? You see that coming through the neutral here of that Y side of the grounding transformer, okay? Uh, so here it goes back here, it divides here and combines here. In there, so you have a complete path. Okay, in order for this to happen, you need that delta to balance the uh, magnetizing ampere turns on this side, on this y side, uh, by the magnetizing ampere turns on the delta side. Okay, so without this delta, this current cannot circulate. So it needs to be a de delta here, you know, I grounded it. That's why you know that's how it's you know, implemented using a grounding transformer. So even if your generator is ungrounded, you can still have grounding system if you have a grounding transformer. So going back here, you can see that although this is a Y, this is Y ungrounded, because you can see this is in neutral here, right? Uh, this is ungrounded here, but then since this is a Y broken delta with actually a, a delta at the broken ends of the, I mean, a resistor across the broken ends of the delta winding, then it's simply the same as Y delta configuration. So with this, the presence of this Y broken delta with secondary resistor is the same as, the, you know, the using a Y delta and then again, it's using us, it is being used as a grounding transformer here, right? So this is how you implement grounding in a uh, neutral grounding in or earthing in, uh, you know, in ungrounded generators. Second type of, okay, so uh, second type of system is a low impedance grounded generator. Um, the low impedance grounded generator is, uh, it, 
reduces the advantage of this is that it reduces risk of shock hazards to personnel caused by stray ground fault in the ground upon path. And also reduces the transient over voltage. Oh, and um, by the way, again, this transient over voltage here, uh, going back to the ungrounded system here, uh, again, when you have a ground fault here, the voltage on the healthy face will increase. It will typically, this is, you know, uh, so what happens is that if you have a ground fault here, this line to ground voltage can approach the line to line voltage volume even higher. Okay, so we're exposing this winding to higher voltage. So, but then if you're using a, a low impedance grounded generator and basically you are just using a small value of resistance on the neutral, you're actually reducing function over voltage. Now, the disadvantage of this is the ground fault current is very high because the current is because of the low resistance, neutral grounding resistance, and generator damage can occur during ground faults. Rapid thermal and mechanical stresses can be experienced by the turbine during turbine generator during ground faults. So what we're saying is this: uh, this is a low resistance on the neutral. Okay. So as you know, the zero sequence current, if you know, the zero sequence network has a very, it has a low zero sequence impedance uh, if you have a, a low resistance on the neutral, okay? So when you have this, um, the current is higher. So what you can, but what they do is sometimes they will design he, he, this uh, to design the ground current about 100 amp to about 150% of the generator ampere rating. So you allow, 100 amperes, 250% amperes, this and, and you know size the, the the resistor based on this generator ampere rating. So you limit you limit the resistance to allow 100 amps to, to about 150% of the generator ampere rating. Now uh, the problem with this is that after you reach the 150%. Um, it's sometimes it's kind of complex or difficult to ensure the uh, to prevent damage to the turbine generator because of the higher high I square R, you know, I square times I squared times times resistance, I current squared times resistance. It's an energy. It's, it needs that energy. This additional energy needs to be dissipated. Okay. So in a, in a solidly grounded system, in a solidly grounded system, when you have, when the resistance is not really, it's, it's really low. So there is not much resistance. So you don't have like that what component, you know, usually the only thing that comes, I mean, majority of the fault is inductive reactive. Okay, it's reactive in nature. It's not, there is no, you know, um, what type, uh, what component that needs to be dissipated. But in this type of seat system, because of the presence of the neutral resistance, uh, when you get the, to the 150% of the rated current, it increases the resistor power loss. This is a concern on the turbine generator rating because of the increase in current related thermal stress and mechanical stresses as well. Okay, so uh, this one is easy. You can easily. Uh, Using a low resistance, um, since you can generate 100 amps, you might be able to use uh, an overcurrent relay and get good sensitivity and get good coordination, you know, uh, protection coordination. Now, if you are using a uh, differential protection, uh, probably uh, differential protection is you compare the, the current coming in and out of the CT. So, with the differential protection, you might be uh, able to do that. But again, if this is only 100 amps. So if your CT ratio is very high, for example, your CT ratio is 2,000 is to 5, you know. So 2,000 is to 5, that uh, relates to 400 is to 1. If 2,000 divided by this 400 is to 1 CT ratio. So 100 amps, if you divide that by 400, that's only point. 
to five amps, you know, that's 0.25 amperes in the relay, you know. So that is very small. Uh, sometimes you cannot get that good sensitivity. Sometimes you need to get it higher. So a lot of times it might, it might not, but it, sometimes it will work, you know. But um, because, of, because when you're dealing with generator, the, the, the CP ratio is very high. It's like, it, for example, the generator is typically in the range of um, 1,000 amperes or 2,000 amperes. Then if it is, you know, 2,000 amperes, then you would need uh, to use a CP primary rating of more than 2,000 amperes. So let's say it's 3,000 is to 5, right? So that 3,000 is to 5, that will correlate. So 3,000 divided by 5, that is 600 is to 1, you know? So 600 is to 1, you, that value is, uh, for example, you have, uh, um, you know, uh, the load is 100 amp, 100, you know, 6, uh, uh, that will be, uh, so it's, let's say, two, uh, your load is 2,000 divided by 400, for example, that you have a 5, uh, 100 over 5, okay, you may, might be able to use this, okay? So, um, so that, th those are the type thing that, you know, because if it is 100 amp, uh, but but, but here is uh, 100 amp. That means that if you're if this 100 amp, if you're using a differential protection for some, you have to compare the current passing here and the current passing here. So if the 100 amp here, uh, you need to compare it with the 100 amp here. So sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't work. So you might have to use, you know, over current protection. It might, you know, it might, it might work. Now, this one is the most... Uh, you know, the typical configuration that we, we, we use. It's a high impedance grounded system. The high impedance grounded system is typical in utility power plants. Uh, one thing, to, one thing to, to understand in neutral in grounding protection is that uh, typically manufacturers will design this generator, um, you know, short circuit ability up to the three phase fault only three phase fault, right? The three phase fault, it's you design the generator, it's say, okay, I want this generator um, design, uh, I will specify the three phase fault capability. And then, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's there, you know? No, but the problem is uh, usually because of the small zero sequence impedance of generators, the ground fault current, the ground fault current tends to be higher than three phase fault current. You know, and, and you know, uh, there are three types of fault current here. We have the three phase fault, car, three phase fault configuration, three phase fault. We have the phase to phase fault, and then we have the phase to ground fault. Then we have the fourth one, which is uh, double line to ground fault, right? So now, in the so if the manufacturer design a generator for a three phase fault configuration, and if the line to ground fault exceed that three phase fault then the generator the generator could be damaged right so uh so typically they they uh we use the high impedance ground system because if it, uh, in, in power plant the line to ground fault is current is higher than the three phase fault current and what we normally do is we limit the current the neutral current from 5 to 25 amperes okay so, so we can reduce the thermal and melting effects in the faulted equipment. Uh, that's the advantage here. Uh, it will reduce the mechanical stresses in circuits and apparatus carrying ground fault currents. It will reduce plus hazard to personnel. And then it will reduce also the transient over voltage to safe levels because of the presence of the neutral resistor. The problem here in high impedance grounded system is that you know, uh, without using uh, the advanced technology, you can only protect the generator up to 95% of the winding, stator winding, okay? But then with the technology nowadays, they have developed those uh, capability using uh, uh, third harmonic, third harmonic uh, protection scheme and the uh, uh, the 20 hertz uh, injection capability that we're going to discuss. Um, because of that, they can protect the generator up to 100% of the state of winding. So let's look at the configuration, this one. 
so this is your winding gear. This is your stator winding gear, right? Next, the, this, is, this is the neutral gear, right? So at the top here is your 100%, 100% winding, and this is the 0% here, right? Uh, typically, what they do is they, uh, we actually introduce uh, a, a relay here element that's connected across this neutral grounding resistor, okay? It's, it's a voltage sensitive element, okay? It's a 59N, uh, device function number 59N. So if, you know, during normal condition, the voltage here is almost zero because this is balanced. If this is balanced, you know, there is no, uh, the voltage, if the voltage here is balanced, so, and uh, if that's balanced, then typically this value of the voltage here at the neutral is low, okay, it's low. Uh, there's no fault. Now, Remember though, again, that there are capacitances associated with operation of the generator. You have the generator, main, and auxiliary transformer, bus, search arrest, arrestor capacitances. They, those are imaginary capacitances. They are not actually, you cannot see them uh, other than the search arrestor which is there, okay? So, uh, but they exist, you know, uh, in electrical engineering, a lot of things that you have, use imagination to make it work. <laughs> but, you can see here that during normal condition, this point here is a very small value. The voltage here is very small because there's no fault. Uh, there's no fault, right? So again, this is 100% here. This is 0% here, right? Now, using a 59N, you can only protect from this 100% up to a certain portion here, up to, let's say, 95% up to this. If, in other words, if there's a fault, here, here immediately at the 100%, it will trip, okay? If you have a fault here at the middle, it will trip. If you have a fault here, let's say at the 80%, it will trip. But if you have a fault here, very close here, you might not, you will not trip. Because it can only see the voltage when you have a fault from this point up to this point here. See? Because... This voltage here is dependent on the location of this fault. Okay, so if you have a fault on the terminal, what you see is a full line to neutral voltage here. So let's say your volt, your your generator is rated at thirteen thousand eight hundred volts, line to line. Okay, line to line. So if you divide that by square root of three, then the line to neutral voltage rating is seven thousand nine hundred sixty-eight volts. Okay, so during normal condition. Okay, this voltage here is almost zero. Okay, so the voltage here from this point up to this point is 7,968. So if this is phase A, this is 7,968 at angle zero. Okay, now this is phase B, for example. So if this is phase B, this is 7,968 at angle 240 volts. The third phase, which is phase C, is 7,968 angle 120 degrees volts, okay? So, when you have a fault here, let's say at here, at, the, at this point, when you have a fault here, if you have a fault here, so what, the, this voltage here is now connected to ground, okay? It's shorted here, right? So if it is shorted here, so this voltage will become almost zero. And, the voltage here will increase to almost line to line. This is almost line to line. But the voltage that was present here from line to neutral will shift here. This will be like 13,800 volts, okay? So if you divide this by the PT ratio here, you have a certain voltage here, secondary voltage that can trigger your 59N, which is a voltage sensitive relay when it picks when it sees a voltage higher than it, it pick 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 up value pick up you know pick up we call it the minimum voltage that it will trip then it's going to trip and sometimes it has uh, a time delay you can introduce time delay there of course you need to introduce time delay in those set points because you don't wanna you don't want a nuisance trip okay so so uh here uh, you see that this one here is uh, it's already 
five o'clock here. Um, are you? Are we still okay? Hello. Uh, hi, Dario. I think we are still okay. Um, uh, if there are any con questions, maybe Patty would like to share uh, one question before we move on. So, sir, so uh, I got a question, po. Okay, so I'll just dictate it. Po. Does high voltages breakers can still operate without relay? No. <laughs> high voltage breaker, they're supposed to be uh, tripped by a relay. I'm so sorry. I, I assume that you already know this. Okay, so for low voltage system, low voltage breaker, they have their, its own trip element. It's a trip device with a breaker. Like for example, 200, the, the, the breaker at home, that's a 220 volt breaker. It has, it's, it, it has its own element or a fuse. Now, let's say a 480 volt breaker, there are breakers that still has its own trip device. But when you go to higher, I mean, higher voltage breakers, you need uh, a relay to trip the breaker. The breaker has a trip coil, okay? The trip coil needs to be tripped by the relay. So the relay is, uh, I'm so sorry, I should have shown this. Uh, uh, okay, so the relay is a device. Uh, let me show. Let me let me show here a, a, a drawing that I can share with you, so you can see the meaning of this. Hold on a second. Here, uh, let's say. So while waiting for Sir Dario, uh, I would just I would just like to remind you that you can um, type in your questions on the chat section. All right. So let me show you here. This is uh, a drawing of the protection system itself. Okay. So can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it, so. All right. So, so this is your this is your neutral grounding resistor here, right? And you can see here these are your CTs. Okay. These are the CT. Uh, this is your power circuit here. This is your neutral. Uh, this is the neutral connection here, and this actually goes to of the portion of the circuit. This is just part of the whole system, a very small part of the system. So uh, during normal condition, current will flow here, right? On the A, B, and C. Uh, in order to actually, these are high voltage, so you need to reduce the current and the voltage to smaller value for relaying purposes, okay? so. We are actually, let's say this one is a 3,000 is to 5 ratio relay, right? So in that, what I mean by 3,000 is to 5, uh, effectively you have 600, 3,000 divided by 600, right? So for example, uh, okay, so let's say uh, there's a fault current about, let's say, a fault current of 10,000 amps flows. Yeah, right there, right? So there's a three phase fault, 10,000 amperes here flowing. So uh, let me see here. So the arrow. Okay, uh, 
All right, it's going that way, right? So, so I have, there's a fault, let's see, on phase A. So there's a big increase of current. So originally, the current, the load current is about, um, about 2,000 amps, uh, uh, 2,500 amps, okay? That's the card, right? Now, uh, let me see, this is 20 to make it more realistic, right? So there's a fault. So the current, typically, so the current at 2,500 amps, that's, if you divide that by CT ratio, which is uh, 3,000 is to 5 is 600, right? So 2,500 divided by 600, that equates to about 4 amps, right? Four amps, right? So if the relay is set at, you know, uh, five amperes, the relay is set at five amperes. And this is just basic, uh, you know. Uh, okay, so it, four amps is below five amps, so it's not gonna trip, right? Uh, now, let's say you have a 20, there's a fault. So 20,000 amps will flow. So 20,000 amps divided by the CT ratio, which is 100. That will be 33 amps, right? So you see 33 amps is a lot higher than the set point, which is five amperes. So it's going to trip, okay? This current 33 amps, this 20,000 amps is flowing on the line, whereas this uh, current 33 amps will flow here, over here. So I'm gonna show here. This is your 33 amps here, right? So this 33 amps goes to the relay. This is your relay here, okay? Now, when the relay sees this, it needs to trip a breaker. The relay needs to trip a breaker. So we go to another drawing now, okay? So go to another drawing here. Okay, see this, this is a lockout relay and a lockout relay is, you know, it operates and then lock out the contact. It, it has a coil and contacts, as co contacts with it. So let's, this one is a, a contact of the relay, the out, the output 101, out 101. This, this is a microprocessor based relay, okay? So when the relay actually sees the fault, the output, out 101 of the relay will close, okay? And when it closes, it actually energizes the lockout 86G2, okay? The 86G2, once it, um, when once there's a voltage here, it is going to trip. And when it trips, it's going to trip associated, uh, you know, associated contact and trips a breaker. So we need to open up another drone again which is updated by 86G2. So we go to the generator uh, trip, which is this one. Okay, so here, this one here is an 86G2 contact. So when it closes, it trips the GC4 and that GC4 goes to the trip coil. Then the generator breaker hits, has its own elementary, which has those trip coils associated with so you need a relay and to trip a breaker that's the whole meaning of it is that clear am i clear hello of course um i think uh dario if they have clarifications they can put it on the chat so we can move on with the presentation yeah. 
Thank you. All right, next. So, oh. <laughs> all right, so here. So this again, then, then this relay will actually, uh, you know, when it reaches the, 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 the pickup voltage, it's going to trip the relay across, uh, you know, because of the fault here, right? Now, when you size this uh, grounding resistor, we got to balance the uh, two things because if you increase the resistor, the risk of transient volt over voltage is it's more. I mean, you're you're imposing more risk to the transient the, the problem of over, transient over voltage. What again by means what I mean by by the, the transient over voltage is that if you have a fault on this, you know, one phase, the healthy phase here will increase. Okay, because of the presence of this uh, capacitances. Now, usually you size this resistor to about one third. Uh, the overall capacity consists of all of this, one third of that. And, uh, you know, not, but uh, if you decrease, however, if you decrease the resistor rating, what you do is it actually exposes the generator to higher damage due to higher ground fault current. It's because, you know, when you decrease the resistance, you're increasing the, the ground fault current. So that's typical, again, this is typically used um, in, in um, you know, in, in the plant. Um, in order to uh, cover the 95, the additional 5% here, which is also, if you have a fault here on the remaining 5%, this is actually destructive sometimes because if you have a fault here and there's another fault on the part of the finding, it can rem remain undetected. And if it is not detected, then it could damage the generator. So what they do is in order to cover this remaining 5%, they have this kind of setup, which is a called, uh, you know, it's a, what, what they do is they actually inject a 20 Hertz uh, to a bandpass filter and continually inject this 20 Hertz, you know, here to the neutral here. Uh, now it's using a 64S relay. It's actually measuring the voltage across the secondary, as well as measuring the current that passes through here. So when there's a ground fault, this, uh, the response of this band filter uh, uh, is going to change, therefore causing the relay to trip. So that's how they implement the 100% uh, using a 20 Hertz bandpass filter, okay? All right. Uh, yeah, sometimes they use a high resistance directly connected to the neutral, but this neutral resistor to be, to tend to be more expensive than the setup here, which is using a neutral grounding transformer, okay? All right, now the problem here is when you're using a, a new a 59N in parallel generators. So the problem associated with this is that if you have a ground fault, let's say you have a ground fault on G3. If you have ground fault on G3, the same voltage will appear on the secondaries of this neutral grounding transformer. So if what happens, all of them will trip. So you don't have selectivity, you know, that's the problem here. So uh, that's why uh, hey, this is typically used in industrial plants, the parallel generators, but it's a little bit more involved to actually uh, design the relaying here because of this problem. So uh, what we can, what we normally do is what we, we have pointed out already, uh, we can use this kind of scheme where you have the Y delta uh, to ground the bus, or what you can do is have uh, some kind of coordination using um, one amp, you know, ground, I mean, current sensitive protection. Sometimes it's really difficult to coordinate this. So that's a problem with generators in parallel. Okay, we go to the transformer, uh, generate transformer system capability limits. Okay, so are you familiar with the reactive capability curve? Okay, reactive capability curve, this is something to do with, uh, again, from our simple generator, we need the magnetic field, right? And we need that 
to either boost the voltage or reduce the voltage. So the voltage and the excitation has something to do with the flow of the megabars. Okay, it's inductive reactive power. So here on the left, you can see that this is your sample generator here and this is your system here. So the system is your transmission system. So you see here that you have a flow of megawatt, megawatt and megabars. You need to have these megabars in order to maintain synchronism between the generator and the system. If you lose synchronism, then you can damage the generator or the turbine, or you can damage, you can cause problems in the system itself. So it needs to be synchronized. So you need that inductive power to maintain that synchronism. And you need to support the megabar requirement of the system because the system itself, it has loads. And the loads are like your cities, your industrial plants, everything is connected in the transmission system. And you need to run the motors. The motors requires megabars to run the motors. So therefore, you need that megabars. To, 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 you need to, the generator to supply the megabars. And that's provided from the excitation system. Now, uh, two types of megabars. It could be lagging. It could be leading. Okay, those are two things that needs to be considered when you when, when you're you know in, you know trying to do uh, pro, uh, implement a protection system for generators. Um, we have what we call the reactive capability curve, and this is a generator reactive capability curve. The generator manufacturer would uh, supply this information to you. Now, as you see here, you have two, ups, two uh, components here, which is the uh, true power, the real power megawatt. That's, of course, that is used to support the heating, lighting, anything that requires you know, true power. Uh, again, I already discussed megabars here, right? So. Here, if you are operating from zero up, up here, it's called uh, overexcited. So you're trying to overexcite. You put more excitation to generator. You increase the magnetic field requirement. So therefore, you are producing what we call lagging megabars. Lagging megabars. Okay. Now, when the system has so much megabars on them, and then the generator needs to actually uh, absorb me megabars because if the system has so much sample at night at night voltage is very high so it needs to uh that that megabars needs to be actually disposed and you know so the the the, the generator needs to absorb those megabars therefore the generator is operating at the under excited excited portion of the reactive capability card here from zero down here Okay, now these are all limits that needs to be considered in the protection system. Okay, so we have three parts here. This is uh, this applies to uh, turbo generators, uh, which is like turb, you know, like steam turbines and stuff like that. Uh, typically, this there's another curve for hydro. Now this one here, you can see that here this is 49 cold air, 40 cold air. It's, it's a different you know um, temperature control. What I'm interested that needs to be discussed with you is the, uh, the me megabar has something to do with the uh, ability to protect the generator. So here, in the overexcited portion here, this limits here is actually the rotor heating limit. Okay, so if you if you exceed this, if you if you're operating above here, you have the risk of getting to the rotor. So the rotor, the, the field, uh, the rotor heating in, uh, he, heating limit. We I've shown you the rotor. You know the first very first first page of the discussion here. Um, now this portion here, actually, this is your stator winding limit. This area here, okay, and this area here, coming down here, is what they call your uh, state or end limit, state or end limit, okay? That state or end is at the end of the state. Usually it's, it has something to do with the leakage flux. Um, this here is your steady state stability limit, okay? When you reach the stability limit, then you lose the story of synchronism. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's now 
uh, separated system in the generator. Okay, so, uh, so, but again, this megabar flow has something to do with the voltage, okay, so excitation, excitation, voltage, megabars. Those are the top that relate related. Megawatt has something to do with the mechanical input from the turbine, on the turbine, okay? So here is the generator reactive capability of the car when, um, during normal condition, okay? Typically manufacturer and as per IEEE, um, you know, um, feature 7102, um, the generator typically is, uh, needs to be uh, operated within the 105% uh, to 95% limits. So it's 0.95 per unit here and 1.05 per unit here. So again, this is Q and this is P. So this is the uh, characteristic of that mega of that Q and P uh, locus here for normal operation at 1.05 voltage right 105 percent so like like this one here this point here this is the uh the, the at 105 percent voltage this is amount of mega bar that can be exported to the system now when the voltage is low 95 percent this point here is the amount of mega bar that can be absorbed by the generator okay now again during when the during daytime system would need megabars. You need to support the system with megabars. Otherwise, if the system does not have megabars, so many loads, so many motors, the system will collapse, okay? So you need megabar support from the generators, from the power plants. So they operate at lagging megabars here. Now you can see that if you keep on increasing the voltage, you know, this area here, that is very high already, you know, very high voltage at this point. And you are subjecting the generator to stresses, insulation stress. If you are increasing the voltage here, going here, let's say you're going to 120%. 120%, let's say your volt, your generator is 13.8 kV times 1.2. That's actually 16.56 kV, 16,506 volts. You don't want that op generator operate at that value for a long time. You need to trip it. So, uh, so therefore you know, you need to, you know, you cannot operate at that. This is too high. So, in, so what I'm saying here is that typically the generator bar output is limited by the terminal voltage, not the generator megawatt output. It's limited by the bar output, okay? Now, here, at the bottom here, here is another, another case. Okay, so if you are operating at 95%, so you're absorbing megabars from the system, normal system. So here, you are operating at 95% here, right? Now, if you are operating here and you suddenly, the system, you need to go back here, down, down, down here, okay? So the problem here is that when that happened, you are actually having lots of uh, magnetic flux at the ends of the rotor, ah, I'm sorry, ends of the stator, you know, a stator core. You have so, so much flux concentration there. And there is not much laminations there, you know. And the problem is that when you have that kind of issue, there will be uh, heating at the ends and can damage your generator, right? So that's your end limit. Now, if, and if you can also do system stability problem because when you get too far here, then the problem is you might lose the stability. So that's the, the, the normal system operation. Now, how is this voltage affected and how is the megabars affected? One case is when you have a, a weaker system, okay? A weaker system means that, okay, when you have, a, you, have, you have the weak system or a normal system, when you have a transmission line and the, trans, the transmission line is, uh, all of them are energized, lines are, everything is okay, it's normal, right? When you are tripping some circuits, trans, transmission circuits, then the system becomes weaker, okay? The impedance becomes higher, it becomes weaker. So in that, in that case, 
you are now again restricting the amount, the voltage that would provide the megabars needed to the system because of the that higher impedance increase. Okay, so here, what you see here is that from this point here, your megabar is now reduced here to BG2, as well as here, your ability to absorb megabar is now reduced here. Okay, so that's the effect of the system. Now, another effect is when the system is changing, okay? So at night, at night, uh, at night, at night, the system voltage is high. So you're here, system is high. So the generator needs to absorb more megabars. You can see here that 95% shifted here at the very bottom here. You're getting to the end core limit here, okay? Now, uh, this is uh, when the system is 100%, and this is when the system is less is operating at less than less hundred less than 100%. Percent. And this is the voltage actually. Uh, by the way, why why am I losing voltage here for a second? Okay. All right. Okay. So that's the effect of the system voltage. So okay. All right, now what's the relay that will help you, uh, you know, during a loss of excitation, loss of field? Again, loss of field has something to do with the voltage. What we have is a loss of field protection, okay? A loss of field protection is it detects the loss of excitation. When it detects a loss of the excitation, that means that you're operating down here, right? Because the, the characteristic of loss of field is over here. So loss of field on synchronous generator is damaging both to the generator and the power system. Undetected loss of field can cause substantial reactive power drain from the system. The generator stator and iron can be of damage in a very short time and loss of field foundation is prolonged. Significant under excitation of the generator causes the rotor retaining ring to be saturated. Loss of field causes a synchronous generator to act as an induction generator. So that means that here it's not synchronized anymore when it's operating as an induction generator. So the loss of field is implemented using a mo characteristic. Uh, it's actually, uh, you know, mo characteristic is like an impedance characteristic. So you know that impedance is uh, voltage and current translates to impedance, right? Because impedance is voltage divided by current. And the characteristic is circular, okay? It's circular. So typically, uh, this is your plus positive inductive reactance here, and this is positive reactance here, okay? So typically, when the system is normal, you would operate on this some, somewhere here, over here, you know? Uh, now, when there's a loss of field, this point will suddenly go inside, inside here, right? So there are two uh, sensitivity uh, settings here, the, the zone one and the zone two. So uh, the zone, the, the, I'm sorry, the zone one and the zone two. Uh, so zone two is more restricted, it's a smaller circle. So typic typically the, 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 when you have a loss of field, it, the, 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 the point will transition here and get inside the circle. When it get, gets to the circle, it, it trip. So the time delay of this bigger circle is smaller than the time delay of this one because when you get this uh, um, no no the uh, no the time delay of this one is larger than the time delay of this one because you know uh, when you get here you need to trip right away when you get to this point inside the circle here right so so there are two settings in the zone one and uh, the zone two. Uh, I can show you an example of a relay uh, setting here. Let me see, show that to you. Um, see here, this is this is a relay program that you we typically set uh, uh, to set those relays. So you will go to the relay set points, and what you see here. Uh, device 40 is the loss of field, okay? So 
here you can see the set points. Uh, it's circle diameter, zone one, 113 ohms, offset minus 9.1 ohms, time delay 15 cycles. Under zone two, 240 ohms and 30 cycles. Okay, that's the, and then it tells you what the, the outputs of the relay, okay? So that's the sample of the relay settings. Okay, so that's loss of field protection. All right, now, overexcitation protection. Overexcitation protection is when you get to this. Uh, so when you get to that overexcited protection, you're operating, you're, you're getting high voltage here, right? So the one of the issues that we need to consider is uh, overexcitation. And overexcitation is the amount of volts per hertz, you know, the amount of volts per hertz. So the volts increases, but the frequency remain constant, for example. That's a volts per hertz scenario. Magnetic materials have maximum flux density that they can support. Okay, so, you know, magnetic materials, you know, flux density is uh, flux divided by the area, okay? So, of course, the, the more flux that needs to pass through that uh, certain area, the more you have those hysteresis and eddy currents. So, uh, equipment failures or operating errors may result to core saturation due to, due to excessive flux, high voltage, meaning high voltage, needed to support the voltage requirements. Damage, of course, due to overfluxing. Eddy currents due to excessive flux on non laminated structures can lead to generator transformer damage due to heating by eddy currents. So, therefore, uh, this is the protection that we need. Typically, it's implemented using um, a, a, an inverse trip and a definite time trip. When you have an inverse time trip, you have a pickup and you have a time dial that needs to be set. This is just an example, you know. The nominal setting, of course, is this, this is the secondary voltage, 115 volts correlates to 13,800 volts if the PT ratio is 120, okay? And that's 60 hertz. So 115 second volt is divided by 60, so 92. So if the voltage, you're operating at 105%, that volts per hertz becomes 2.01. So that's how you set it. Um, this is a typical, um, um, excitation uh, protection characteristics. You have this uh, pick up here. This is your inverse time here. So you can see this is time in minutes and this is the percent volts per hertz. So, so you, as you increase the volts per hertz, you are actually decreasing the amount of time to trip. So here you can see this is definite time pick up here at this point. So at 125%, the time that needs to trip it is about 0 0.05, okay? Now, uh, if it is an inverse time, this is an inverse time here, you can see that, it, that the tripping is the, the amount of, the tripping is dependent on the amount of volts per hertz in the time. So as the volts per, volts per hertz become smaller, the times becomes bigger, the time to trip. So that's your protection parameter sticks for volts per hertz. Unbalanced currents. Unbalanced currents that's caused by, uh, let's say you have a face-to-face -face fault or you have a series fault, one line open, or for example, uh, too big, the, the unbalance is too high you know, among the loads. Then uh, you have unbalanced currents. And when you have unbalanced currents, you, have, you, have, you produce negative sequence current. Okay? During normal condition, the only sequence components that you have are positive sequence components. When you have an imbalance, then you produce that negative sequence current. And that results to reverse rotating field that induces double frequency currents in the rotor leading to rapid heating. So that can cause rotor heating damage, okay? That's imbalance. Now, I3 police CPT.13 has requirements on the uh, manufacturer for the uh, uh, permissible negative sequence current, you know, like 10% uh, for indirectly full drop or blah, blah, blah here, okay? All right, so uh, negative sequence current, you need to use the device function 46, which again, it has alarm and trip. Uh, so you set that inverse time and definite time. Um, 
that will be dependent on the study that you have to do in order to set this. Okay, so it depends. It depends on you know the allowable negative sequence uh, unbalance that the generator can handle. So you have to set it from there. Okay. Now, right, phase overcurrent. Now, phase overcurrent. That's used the typical uh, protection that used there is differential protection and overcurrent protection. Uh, <clears throat> In of differential protection, uh, nowadays we have microprocessor-based relays that is provided with percentage slow percentage differential characteristics. <clears throat> Before, when the relays were still electromechanical, we don't have this capability to produce a dual slope, so we have only one slope. Okay, slope is actually <coughs> the ratio of that restrained current to the operating current. So with that the variable slope, um, you can detect, you have extreme sensit sensitivity for internal faults, but insensitive to error currents during severe external faults. So uh, in, 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 in a differential operation, um, you have two CPs, uh, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's monitoring the input, the input and the output to the differential relay. So if the fault is external to that motor monitoring zone, then you have an external fault. If the fault is within that zone, then you have an internal fault. So the, for example, it's a generator protection. So if it is a generator protection, the generator winding itself is inside that protection zone. So when you have a fault in the generator, then you have an internal fault you have to provide that extreme sensitivity. That's called your differential sensitivity. Now, if the fault is on the, let's say the fault is on the generator step-up transformer, it's not covered by the zone of protection. Therefore, if there's a fault on the transformer, that is considered an external fault. And if it is an external fault, the transformer differential, differential should drift, but not the generator protection. So that's one thing good here with the variable slope. It provides extreme sensitivity for internal faults, but insensitive to error currents during severe external faults. Okay. Now, backup overcurrent protection. A little bit difficult to set the backup overcurrent protection because the, the problem is that, again, with the presence of that XD a while ago that I talked told you about, because of the, the changing characteristic of the impedance of the generator. When you have a fault, that impedance is very small, leading to high current, okay? And as the fault progresses, it decays exponentially. So the impedance now is become, become, becomes bigger, the current becomes smaller. So uh, then in that case, if you don't have something that can synthesize between that small value and the high value is kind of difficult to uh, set. The other problem here is that the load current of generator is very high. So just imagine if you have a, a generator, let's say uh, the rating of the generator is 2000 amps. Okay. Now, if the, the sustained fault, you know, because of the, that high XD, is only 1,800 amps, okay? So you allow 2,000 amps, okay? But then you need to set the relay at 1,800. So in other words, even if during load condition, you are tripping the relay. You're going you're gonna to trip the relay because the set point is only 1,800, but you need a load of 2,000 amps. So how do you do? How do you implement this protection now? It's not possible to use just a simple overcurrent. So what you do is, you introduce some kind of a restraint. Okay, you prevent the generate that the, the relay to trip the generator under that load condition where the voltage is normal. Because when there is a fault, the normal is low. The voltage is low. When there is normal, the, when the when the system is normal, load system is normal, the voltage is normal. When there's a fault, voltage is low. Okay, so you can use a voltage restraint or a voltage control over current protection. This is intended to back up the differential protection. So when there's a fault, when there's a, a under load condition, voltage is normal, 
it, the voltage will prevent the overcurrent to fret. When, the, when there is fault, the voltage becomes low and the voltage restrain pickup and allows the overcurrent to trip the circuit. So that's your backup overcurrent protection. Loss of synchronization, that's affected by seven, seven to eight function, which is this out of step protection. What happens is that, again, this is a more circle. When you have a, a fault in the system and, uh, and, and if that fault is uh, interrupted, right, interrupted right away by the system, it's considered as a stable swing. So there are types of swing. The first type is a stable swing. The second type is the unstable swing, okay? The stable swing is that, of course, the power system, uh, this, this impedance will swing, it will swing when there's a fault, but if it is interrupted, if it is cleared right away by the transmission system, then it's a stable swing. The problem is that if there's a fault, it's not interrupted, you can lose synchronism, okay, between the stator and the rotor, okay? So what happens is that, you know, when you lose synchronism, you got to trip the generator for out of step. So this, this, this type of protection typically they have a single blinder element here, and this is your more type. What, once there's a once there's a fault, you know, um, a fault in the system or something that will cause a swing, uh, impedance will travel inside here. It, once it it gets to the first blinder here, this is a blinder, right? So if it's a stable swing, it comes back out, so it's not gonna trip. Now if that impedance goes to the first blinder and tra traverse the second blinder here then it's considered uh, unstable uh, swing and it should trip the generator. So that's your out of step, okay? Unstable, process here, stable, comes back up. Inadvertent energization protection. Uh, this is accidental energization of the generator from the system at standstill, meaning it's, let's say you're doing maintenance shutdown. It's out, it's offline. And then suddenly the breaker closed. It will, uh, and then you energize the generator at standstill. It becomes an induction motor. High current during acceleration will damage the generator. Uh, this is affected by some kind of logic. Uh, we have uh, an arming delay. We have an arming input here, uh, dependent on the voltage. So uh, when you are, at, you know, under during maintenance, this is now armed. Okay, the voltage is low. It's armed. So there is a one here, input here. The input here is zero. So one and zero is zero, okay? So now when suddenly the breaker is closed, uh, generator is still. this is arm at one, and then you get an input here of one here, one and one, it becomes one here. So the relay will pick up. So that's your in, in average energy statement. Uh, loss of mechanical input to generator, again, it's reverse power. It's a generator monitoring. This is, you, you're using reverse power protection for this. So we uh, set it, we, we, deter, we get the voltage and the current input and determine the setting in watts, the reverse watts, okay? Uh, that's device number 32, reverse power protection. Uh, the last one is the abnormal voltage and frequency. Of course, we have the phase over voltage and the phase under voltage, 59, 27, frequency 810 and U over frequency under frequency. And uh, this is the end of the story. Uh, hopefully it helps you guys. Thank you, Sir Dario. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a, a question on the chat section. Okay, so, so what happened to the generator if we operate it on the over excitation area or more and under excitation area or below and how it happens? It's like what I've stated, let's go back to the... Uh, what happens uh, again? It, it, the, let's see here. Let's go back to the. I should have not closed this. 
Let me share it again. So when you have overexcitation, you have a high volts per hertz. This is, we discussed this. And you need to trip the generator. The relay will trip the generator. Okay. Any more, next question? Did, that, did I satisfy, satisfy the question? Okay, What's okay the so next? Um, I think, the, okay. He says he's writing the next one. <laughs> okay. While we're uh, we, uh, sorry, sorry. Regarding, uh, regarding how it happens, um, that's because of some operating, for example, uh, let's say the exciter is not working well. It becomes, uh, let's say it's, it's got trouble, it's got host. Uh, exciter itself or the excitation control, there's a problem on the ABR. Suddenly the voltage goes very high. That can be a cause of the problem. excitation becomes the, the, the source of the problem, the exciter itself, or the ADR. Uh, sir, can you see this? Uh, what part that produce P in power plant be produced by the generator and I will be show and I will be shown after it to got the load in my power plant power adjustment is controlled by boiler operator. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's the mechanical input from the steam. Um, that's mechanical input. So mechanical input in power is translated to the generator um, um, power. Uh, and of course, it needs to be controlled through the governor. So one form of that is using the the controller in the you know boiler uh, it, it's it's actually a, a complex system on the mechanical side so there is a governor control systems that's associated with that it controls the flow of mechanical input so it's a control system also by itself All right, if that answers your question, can you give us a thumbs up, Paul? Okay, so um, I think that's about it. We don't have any more questions regarding this webinar. We do have a uh, post-evaluation poll. Uh, we would like you to answer. Okay, folks, uh, really thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to, uh, um, I hope I can ha I help you a little, a little bit, if not much. Um, so my intention is hopefully uh, this will help you in your day-to-day uh, -day, day -day work in your power plants. And uh, it's uh, something that I can help you with specific things. Uh, you know, feel free to... Uh, to reach out and uh, maybe call um, Patty and uh, yes. call this uh, uh, winds. Yes, so just in case uh, you have specific inquiries. This is a little bit uh, fast paced. There are too many, too many things to be discussed actually in our plant protection. And uh, 
um, I'm sorry, some of them can be very complicated. Um, so it really needs time to sort this out and think about it, um, you know, um, in, in both smarts analysis uh, and also calculations and, you know, control systems. So that's, that's, uh, so uh, in case, uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you, you need help. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Sir Dario. Everyone, please give it up for uh, our speaker for today, virtual. <laughs> yeah, and so we uh, we also we do plan to have a more comprehensive course next year, and we hope to have you with us for further um, announcement or notifications. Please do um, follow us on our Facebook page as, as well as our LinkedIn. Um, business page and so um, we can notify you regarding this course okay thank you okay so um thank you everyone have a good day i think this is the end of this webinar um have a good day uh, have yes enjoy the uh, the rest of the day and stay safe Sir Vince, would you like to add Yes, uh, Dario, in behalf of Erudite Reliability Services, I would like to say thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and answering the questions of our participants. We encourage uh, our participants to collaborate with us. If you have any clarifications or questions, you can, as Patty mentioned, you may reach us through our Facebook page or through our LinkedIn uh, page, and we can relay it to Dario. And I hope that Dario would be open to answer some of your questions. And of course, if you want to learn more about uh, our um, trainings, as well as Dario's uh, more comprehensive approach on this topic, we invite you all to um, be with us as we finalize the schedule of this comprehensive training next year. So Dario, maraming maraming salamat. And I it's hope... I just, I just hope that I was able to help a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And we wish everyone a, a safe and um, great weekend. And we hope to see you again soon. God bless you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.